So what we want to do is find that point or points who either have a larger function value than all nearby points or a smaller function value than all nearby points. So we need to establish a process that's going to allow us to do that. <clears throat> and the end result here is going to be potentially a little more complicated, um, or at least definitely not as intuitive as constructing sign charts. Um, we're going to calculate some different values, uh, use those to make some comparisons. Based off those comparisons, it's going to allow us to classify our points. So we're going to start off with a theorem that tells us that if we have some point f of a, b, and that point is a local extremum, meaning it is a maximum or minimum for the function f of x, y. So we're assuming we already found this point or somehow know this point to be an extremum. If both f sub x, so the derivative with respect to x, and f sub y, partial derivative with respect to y, exist at this given point a, b, <clears throat> Then the first derivative with respect to x evaluated at that point a, b should be equal to 0. And the first partial derivative with respect to y evaluated at that point a, b should also be equal to 0. So if we have a point that we know is an extremum, the first derivative should be equal to 0 at that point, uh, first derivative with respect to x, and the first derivative with respect to y. The problem is that the converse of that statement is not true. So what that means is, if we take the first derivative, f sub x, evaluated at a, b, and if that's equal to 0, and if the partial derivative with respect to y, evaluated at a, b, is also equal to 0, then the point a, b may be a local extremum, or it may not. So simply finding that our derivative functions evaluate at those points, give us a value of 0, aren't enough to classify that point as a local extremum. But it does give us a starting point, meaning the first thing that we want to do is identify these critical points, whether there's one or more. So we want to identify these critical points by solving the first derivative with respect to x set equal to 0, and the first derivative with respect to y set equal to 0. So finding these two results, finding the xy coordinate pairs that give us these results, are going to give us candidates to consider as local extrema, but we'll have to test a little bit more to come up with a specific classification or to, to verify that they are, in fact, local extrema. So to use this, we're going to use the second derivative test for local extrema, which tells us that for some function, z equals f of x, y, and if we have some point a, b that's a critical point, meaning if we plug a and b in for x and y, these two statements should both be true. And then we have these three values that we're going to introduce. Capital A, which is equal to the first partial derivative with respect to x, second partial derivative with respect to x, evaluated at a, b. Capital B, which is the first derivative with respect to x, second derivative with respect to y, evaluated at a, b, and then this value c, which will be the first and second derivatives with respect to y, evaluated at the point a, b. So we're going to use these values a, b, and c to classify our point, and we'll have three different cases to consider. If our result a times c minus b squared is greater than 0, and our value a is greater than 0, or I'm sorry, our value a is less than 0, then f of a, b is a local maximum. 
if this exact same expression, a times c minus b squared, turns out to be something positive, so greater than 0, and our value for a is greater than 0, then our point f of ab is considered to be a local minimum. So this isn't a terribly intuitive process. There's no sign chart that we can really construct to help us understand the behavior of our function. So it comes down to calculating these three values, evaluating ac minus b squared. In either case, if we get a positive value, then the next step is to look at our value for a, and whether that's negative or positive determines whether we have a maximum or a minimum. So those are our first two cases. The next case is the case where AC minus B squared is something less than zero. So in that case, we would say that F of XY has a saddle point at AB. So saying that there's a saddle point is the same thing as saying that there is no maximum or minimum. If we were to think of this in two-dimensional space, so just a function with one independent variable, that's similar to the idea of a function that starts off increasing, levels out for a second, and then continues increasing. So our sign chart for the first derivative, even though we would have a zero, the sign of that first derivative wouldn't change. So the function would change from increasing to increasing, or more specifically, wouldn't change. It would be increasing, level out for an instant, and then continue increasing. So the idea of a saddle point is the same thing in three-dimensional space. Our function levels out, but then continues either increasing or decreasing. So the first two cases, we get specifically a maximum or a minimum. In the third case, we have a saddle point, which means neither a max nor a min. And then our fourth case is if a times c minus b squared ends up being exactly equal to 0, then what we say is that this test fails. So what that means is it doesn't classify the point as a maximum, a minimum, or a saddle point. It means that essentially, from conducting the test, getting this result, we learned absolutely nothing about the point. We won't be considering cases like that, but there are cases where this test could fail, meaning some other approach would need to be implemented. So the three that we'll be concerned with will be looking at case one, two, and three, finding these values for A, B, and C, and then classifying our point as meeting one of those three cases.